Friday, and we are about to tackle one of the most complicated Gospels in the canon. It is thick. I'm going to uh, have to be cursory in some ways. Uh, and I don't want to get into all the details, so I hope you do take the time to read the reading. Um, this, this fourth chapter of John that has this well-known story takes place at Jacob's well. Uh, this is thought to be the well of, of where, where Jacob finally comes to settle. In Jacob's lifetime, I really believe it's, it's a well of brokenness. And this is a story of that well being healed, uh, the, the, the image of the well. It becomes a place of reconciliation. It becomes a place of, of, of living water. In Jacob's time, Jacob, who his whole life has, has been turmoil, he and his brother are fighting in the womb. They try to, you know, Jacob tries to crawl out over his brother, but his brother is still the firstborn. His brother's going to inherit everything, so uh, Jacob, along with the help of his mother, tricks his father by dressing up as Esau, getting his father to think he's his brother and stealing his brother's blessing and his birthright. Years later, there is an opposing story of uh, Jacob wrestling with this sort of heavenly figure. I'm going to use the word angel for now, and I will let the translation experts argue over what, what the actual translation should be. But we all know the story of Jacob's ladder, and he's wrestling with this angel, and all he wants to let the angel go is to call him by name and bless him. He wants to be blessed for who he truly is. He has lived his whole life in the shadow of his father blessing him because he pretended to be someone he wasn't. Yeah, I, this, this is a story that we all can relate to. In our youth, we pretend to be almost anyone to get people's good favor. And hopefully, we all get to that point in life where we are willing to wrestle as long as it takes to bring who we truly are forward and, and, and wrestle for a blessing in the world, wrestle for favor for who we truly are. So that's the Jacob story that this is set against. But there's the brokenness of it is this. Right after Jacob receives the blessing for who he truly is, he's going to kind of confront Esau again, as the story goes there. They're marching back to their homeland. He's finally ready for his homecoming because he's come to terms with who he truly is. And out comes Esau with his tribe and Jacob with their tribe. And the two are coming together, and, and it looks like a big confrontation. And Jacob is ready to give tribute and try to patch things up because he has built Esau into this... You know, he knows he's wronged Esau. Esau's been angry with him all these years. He's ready for battle. He's ready to do anything he can. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And he's worried about it, you can tell, for a long time. He gets there, and he offers his tribute, and Esau says, keep your things. Come home. I'm, Esau's not mad. Esau wasn't a villain. Jacob has lived his whole life Wondering what would happen if he ever ran into the person he wronged. And the person he wronged had forgiven him years ago. Esau was a good man. Esau, was, Esau is this amazing character. I think Esau is the image of God in this story. And as we see this new story unfold in the New Testament, we realize that Esau is very much like God saying... I'm not holding anything against you. Come home. The reason I say that early story ends in brokenness is because Jacob says, go ahead, we'll follow you tomorrow. And then he wanders off and he finds this well near Shechem and he builds another life there. He can't go home again. And we're never quite told why. But we, we get a sense because of the order of events that he just couldn't accept this complete forgiveness of Esau. Esau wanted nothing. Esau didn't expect, you know, um, restitution. He didn't, he expected nothing. Just come home. And for the first time, I sometimes think Jacob 
realized that Esau had not been the villain. Maybe he had. Maybe Jacob had been the villain in that whole story. He couldn't face it. And so he makes a life for himself with his well. Years later, the well comes back in this story. And it's a woman who is as isolated from the world as she can be. And she encounters Jesus, who offers her this conciliatory water of life. And it changes her. And when I say she's isolated, remember, the Samaritans were looked down on by the Jews. Women were looked down on by men. And she seems to, in the story, be a woman whose character was probably looked down on. She's been married several times. And as Jesus says, the man you're married to now is not your actual husband. Or the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the translation kind of lets you go, well, what is going on? And there are some interesting uh, interpretations of, of what he's talking about. But beyond what her social character is, we know she's isolated because, one, this, this well doesn't seem to be terribly close to the town. And there's no one else there. The well was where women gathered to visit them. One of their few jobs that they did outside the home, outside the constant um, attention of their family, the one place where they could journey alone and not cause scandal was to go get water. That was part of their daily routine. The women got water from the well. And it was where they visited. It was where their social life happened. You know, we, we to this day, we have gathered groups in churches around the world. Who, the, here at MBB, we used to have the, the women at the well. This is where they shared who they were. And she is clearly, we would assume, not welcome at the well in town. She is coming to a remote well, and she's there alone. And so, you know, the, the story has this stark beginning of a well of brokenness, a well that Jacob, who was isolated by his own inability to reconcile, he is isolated from his brother for the rest of his life. We never hear of a reconciliation beyond that. And here is a woman who is also unable to reconcile. The story of this dialogue between the two gets very heady, very theological. That's just a that is how John, now this fourth gospel writer, writes. Um, no one seems to be pithy in, in, in his world. Everyone speaks in long Greek style philosophical discourses. And this is quite the dialogue between Jesus and this woman. And and through it, there's a back and forth, and it's it almost has a snarky feel to it. They're, they're challenging each other. But in the end, when she starts to come to believe that he is the Messiah, there's something sort of miraculous that happens that we are it doesn't quite explain it in the text. She goes back to the town and she tells all these people that she's she's found the Messiah and come and that's the story that we'd love to hear. It is a story of the last person in the world that they would think God would come to because she is she's pretty far down on, on the uh, social totem pole. And God always comes to the unexpected. And yet, some moment of grace, they listen to her. She evangelizes a town. A woman, and a woman who seems to be on the outs with everyone comes in and says, guess what? God spoke to me. I found the Messiah. These are hard cells. And we don't really ever hear how that went. We know she goes into the town and many people come to believe through her. There's even a tradition in the Eastern Orthodox and the Eastern Catholic churches where she is venerated as a saint, um, Saint Fortina. Uh, photo, literally, light, phos, phota. Um, and, and, and so her name roughly translates to one who is luminous, who is, who is you know, a light bearer. So we have this woman who becomes this great symbol of, of Christianity and of evangelization, and she starts out in such an isolated place. The difference between Jacob and her is that God says, come home. And 
she's open to the grace. We don't see acts of contrition, acts of penance. We're not told how her life turns around. We're not told whether you know she gets everything into order and becomes a good, uh, you know, a, a good synagogue attending temple sort of, uh, you know, Jewish woman. We we don't we have no idea what happens. We know she's open to the grace of God. It's not about winning God's love. It's not about winning God's mercy. It's about accepting it. I think all of us are in a place of isolation. I think all of us are in a place where we battle back and forth between being who we truly are and worrying about whether people will give us their favor, acceptance, blessing, call it what you wish. I think this is a moment of stillness for all of us to examine who we are in the world. It, 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 is, it is a double-edged battle to bring who we are to the surface and then to accept when we say, okay folks, this is who we really are, and they go, yeah, we knew, to accept it. I, I think it's one of the most um, one of the most disheartening things people go through when, when they finally go to someone and say, I, I have to tell you something I've never told you before. And they come out with it and you go, uh-huh. And, and, and they're kind of shocked. And I'll tell you, when you finally tell people, here's a story out of my past that I, that, you know, this is something I've been troubled with. This happens in confession. I really think they're expecting something different. And I have to tell you, I've heard the stories of people going to confession and having a priest scream and yell or something, the, the priest just isn't doing their job. You know, confession's not a sacrament. Um, you, 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 you know, uh, telling me what you did isn't a sacrament. Me telling you what's wrong is not a sacrament. Absolution is that sacramental moment. That's the sacramental moment. And where I can certainly be of help, and it is good to, you know, help people reflect and all those things can be part of a minister's job. The priestly job, which is sac sacrament, the only moment I'm doing my priestly job is when I'm giving you the absolution. Everything else leads up to that. And I think we have to trust one another with that. You know, as we, as we hopefully in a few weeks come back out into the light with one another, I hope we come back out with new resolve that we are not going to live in the waters of brokenness. We're called to the waters of new life. We are called to the waters of healing. We are called to let, let people know who we are. They are not villains waiting to pounce on us. Those villains may be out there, but there are people in the world waiting to hear who we really are so that they can bless us. We should never deprive God or them of that. It is not winning God's love that is the journey. It is accepting it, as the woman at the well did, as Esau was able to do so easily, as we wish Jacob could have done, as all of us are called to do every day.